tonight on News Center. A significant moment for artificial intelligence in the final game of their historic match, AlphaGo defeats human grandmaster Isedol, finishing the best of five series with four wins and one loss. North Korea says it would soon test a nuclear warhead and ballistic missiles capable of carrying those warheads. The South Korean leader responds that the North would only lead itself to self-destruction if it continued confrontation with the international community. And the first non-military president in Myanmar since the military junta took power in a 1962 coup. News Center begins right now. It is 9 a.m. in New York, 1 p.m. in London, and 10 on a Tuesday night here in Seoul. Hello and welcome to our viewers all across the globe. You're watching Arirang News Center. North Korea will only lead itself to self-destruction if it continues to threaten peace on the Korean Peninsula, warns President Park Geun-hye responding to North Korea's latest threats that it will test its nuclear warheads and ballistic missiles capable of carrying those warheads. The South Korean president wants her officials to rev up cooperation with key member states of the United Nations. Our presidential office correspondent Song ji sun has our top story. President Park Geun-hye has called for South Korea to be at full defense readiness and to reinforce strategic communications with its allies in the face of the constant military and cyber threats from North Korea. Pukani,いろけ,ぶりはんとばるは,国際社会で한강한대립을계속하면서변화의길로나서지않는다면,그것은스스로자멸의길을걷는것이될것입니다.앞으로북한이변화하지않고또다시도발할경우,우리정부와
Today's statement by North Korea is just their claim. According to the analysis we and the U.S. have conducted, they have not yet developed missile reentry technology. A military official told Seoul based on up news. The North's claims are aimed at flexing its military muscle and are not grounded in reality. The U.S. State Department also condemned North Korea's recent claims, saying the regime should stop its rhetoric. China's foreign ministry also called on Pyongyang to stop escalating tensions on the peninsula. However, some experts predict North Korea could conduct a high-profile provocation, such as a fifth nuclear test or a long-range missile launch, in the coming weeks or months. North Korea has the capability to launch another nuclear test at any given moment. All that's needed is a political decision. South Korea's defense ministry says there's no unusual activities north of the border. However, given this latest warning, it plans to heighten the surveillance of the regime. Kim Hyun-bin, Arirang News. Now, in the nation's political realm, with the general election less than a month away, Korea's political parties are busy laying out campaign pledges. The latest batch pledges to focus on tackling the nation's sky-high youth unemployment rate. Our parliamentary correspondent Shin Se-min files us this report. Nine and a half percent of young Koreans are out of work as of January this year, the highest youth unemployment rate in 16 years. That figure is likely much higher if people who are actively searching for employment and people in part-time jobs were factored in. And with a general election less than a month away, Korea's political parties are seeking to tailor some of their campaign pledges to attract this group of young Koreans searching for jobs. The ruling Senate Party promised to expand its so-called Youth Hope Fund program, which aims to provide advice for young job seekers. This program, currently located in Seoul, would be expanded to 16 cities and provinces within the next three years. The main opposition Minju Party of Korea is pledging to give 50,000 young job seekers a monthly allowance of 600,000 Korean won or 500 U.S. dollars for six months to support their job hunting efforts. The minor opposition People's Party is pledging to give young job seekers loans of up to $2,500 interest-free over the period of six months and would come due if the person finds a job. It is also pledging to impose a five-year employment quota on public and private firms, requiring 5 percent of staff be under 34, which it says will create 83-thousand jobs. Pundits, however, have raised concerns that the plans are like handouts that will discourage young people from actively seeking work, and that in none of the pledges address the core issue, which is the lack of new jobs for young people. Shin Se-min, Arirang News. Now, the five-game challenge between Korea's Padu Grandmaster Lee Sedol and the AlphaGo supercomputer has concluded with machine beating human four games to one. Now, this high-profile event doesn't just leave us with a winner and a loser, but rather it's left us with unlimited possibilities in terms of human ingenuity and the future of artificial intelligence. Man versus the machine or man with the machine. News feature tonight with Lee Ji Won. After five long hours and 280 moves, Lee Sedol resigned. The five-game challenge between Korean Grandmaster Lee Sedol and AlphaGo came to an end on Tuesday, with AlphaGo winning 4-1. People will continue to debate the competitors' move and how each won, but the meaning of artificial intelligence and human intelligence has left us with more to think about. This tournament is the first competition between an AI system and a top-level professional player, which is why it gained global attention even before it started. I believe this is the first step towards battles between mankind and AI. It's going to write a new history for both Baduk and artificial intelligence. AlphaGo's advanced programming had opinions split over who or what would emerge as a champ. But when the supercomputer took the first game, there was still shock. 
Many people thought AlphaGo had the advantage, but half the people who know Paduk thought Isidor was going to win, so they were very surprised at the outcome. Some didn't think AlphaGo could beat Isidor, but now that it has, they're starting to think that AI has outsmarted humans in Paduk, like it did with the game of Shogi or Japanese chess. And as AlphaGo continued to rack up wins, it marked a turning point in how Koreans view artificial intelligence. At first, I thought AlphaGo was just luck in the first game, but as the tournament progressed, I was surprised to see what it was actually capable of. It's surprising to see that artificial intelligence can compete with human intelligence, and at the same time, it's also a little scary. Artificial intelligence could sound like something in a science fiction movie, but in reality, it's everywhere in our daily lives. Google Translate, for instance, is an AI program that uses an algorithm that employs a combination of neural networks and deep machine learning to recognize letters and words, find the appropriate meaning, and do a translation. Driverless cars are perhaps one of the most controversial applications of artificial intelligence that's in development and on the way to commercialization. But all of these advancements have raised the question of how much should humans rely on AI, as well as the fear that AI could eventually take over humanity. One obstacle to commercialization of autonomous cars is a concerning possibility of accidents and whether human safety is at risk. The AI devices developed so far are weak, meaning it does not have consciousness, sentience and mind. So while it may be exact in its calculations, situations that go beyond its database and algorithm will shake its system. And that's exactly what happened when AlphaGo lost to Isidol in the fourth match, where the computer got flustered by one of E's moves and then it made a fatal mistake. Through the latest Paduk match, many were amused at how smart artificial intelligence has become. But that doesn't mean we should worship it. In the end, humans created these machines, and we shouldn't fear them, but use them as a tool. Experts added that instead, we should focus on creating a set of ethical regulations to make sure that we're ready to fully use the resources when they become available. Because in the end, it's all the more for humanity. We, know, we do not know who will win, but we know that at the end, humans will be smarter, that the world will be a much better place. Lee Ji-won, Arirang News. Well, we saw over the past week and the final game between AlphaGo and Isidore is a big deal for humanity with lots of implications that stretch far beyond a board game. The final match between the first, uh, between the first official match, in fact, of man versus machine may be over, but the bigger contest is by no means over. In the studio with me to provide us some perspective is uh, Chung Tae Myung. Professor Chung is head of software development at Songgyung Gwan University. Professor Chung, welcome to the program. Hi. Now, I'm sure you watched the match between AlphaGo and uh, human champion Lee Se Dol. I'd like to know before we get into anything else, your overall thoughts. It was a very interesting game, first of all. Then to say precisely it was not just the goal game between the e Sedor and AlphaGo. Actually, it was uh, the match between the human and the computer. Since AlphaGo used more than 1,200 CPUs, which means brain, and unlimited memory space, uh, while e Sedor used just one single brain and a limited memory. Also, AlphaGo probably used not only the learned patterns, but also the search of all the possible cases. It was quite possible because AlphaGo can search more than 10 million different cases within two uh, given minutes. When you say deep learning, um, I know that this, is, this does not mean it's just based on massive data. Deep learning is learning the machines, learning the way humans think. So is the ultimate goal of AI to mimic the human brain, to say? The deep learning, the AI technology is not uh, the only uh, uh, technique to apply to solve some problems. We are using the parallel computing, we are using the uh, data sciences to analyze the data, and also learning things from the old previous patterns. They are all integrated in one algorithm and given to the computer, then the computer can apply it to the games to solve the problems. Then this whole thing is 
to mimic the, uh, the human brain and human way of thinking. So if a robot could, um, through artificial intelligence, could really, um, I suppose, gain the intelligence of the human, the human brain, uh, what about emotions? Can we build a robot with emotions, of sense of identity even? As a computer scientist, I think it's possible. Think about the color. How can we implement the color into the computer? We digitalize the color into the computer and sounds too. So if we can digitalize the emotion and sense of identity, why not? We can have the computer uh, this emotion and the sense of identity. So which means that the, the digitalization is the key word in this sense. Right, digitalization. Um, so we know that Google's been obviously investing in the sector of artificial intelligence for some time. We know that Apple is also uh, China's Baidu. So a lot, may, major names have been investing in the research and development of artificial intelligence. I'd like to know how far along Korea is. Google invested about $30 billion uh, for AI since 2001. Then. Uh, then moreover, the result of their R&D already applied to in real human life. For example, the cognitive the computing solution at IBM, the Watson, it already applied in various app services. They are deployed in the hospitals. They participate in the examining the cancers. So they go ahead. Compared to them, we have a long way to go. I think we are still in the stage of studying artificial intelligence in academia. All right, Chung Tae Myung, Professor um, of Software Development at Sung Kyung University. Thank you so much for uh, being with us tonight. Thank you. It's been four years since the Korea-U.S. free trade agreement took effect. The outcome? So far, so good. Thanks in part to the FDA, Seoul's exports to Washington have steadily risen and the share of the world's largest market has hit a 15-year high. Our Kim Min-ji reports. It's been four years since the Korea-U.S. free trade deal came into effect. Although Korea's overall exports have been on a downward spiral for 14 straight months in the face of uncertainties at home and abroad, the country's shipments to the U.S. have fared relatively well thanks to the FTA. Last year, Korea's total exports fell 8 percent on year, while outbound shipments to the U.S. edged down just 0.6 percent. Korea's share of the U.S. market also reached 3.2 percent last year, the highest in 15 years. The figure might seem small, but compared to Japan, which does not have a bilateral trade deal with the U.S., Korea has been on a steady upward trend. The utilization rate of the FTA hit 71 percent last year, with Korea's shipments of automobile parts and tires posting notable growth. Although the market share seems like a small figure, given the sheer size of the U.S. market, it's significant. As for Korea's imports from the U.S., shipments fell slightly last year. While there was an uptick in automobiles and LPG, the overall drop was mainly driven by a slump in imports of grain, stock feed and medical products. And despite Korean farmers' concerns that imports of agricultural produce, livestock and fish from the U.S. would rise, inbound shipments of those goods fell over 10 percent last year from the year before. Down the line, the prospects for Korean automakers are looking good, as a 2.5 percent export tariff was eliminated at the start of this year. Other sectors to benefit include the auto parts industry, industrial boilers and chemical supplies. But some experts say the benefits of the FTA may be short-lived. I think it's one-dimensional for us to say the Korea-US FTA is bringing us benefit. That's true. But at the same time, if we think about the future, the future may be heavily affected by how other countries behave uh, and, and excel in the U.S. market because uh, they are competing with the Korean exporters in the U.S. market. Experts say it's important for Korea to position itself well in the markets it already has a presence in before its competitors gain a stronger foothold. Kim min -ji, Arirang News. Chinese companies are rapidly becoming the biggest players in the global merger and acquisition market, largely due to their efforts to counter an economic slowdown in their home country. Our Kim ji reports. 
Chinese enterprises are the new giant in international mergers and acquisitions. Their activities in recent months resemble the global expansion that Japanese firms carried out in the 1980s. Last year, China hit a record high of more than 106 billion U.S. dollars in value in the global M&A market. And it's on pace for another record this year. During the first three months, its global M&A market surpassed $101 billion, according to London-based market researcher Dialogic, driven mainly by concerns over China's economic slowdown. Many enterprises sought to transfer their funds overseas due to falling asset prices and the devaluation of the Chinese currency. But with government support, they've taken up opportunities to enter the global market and build up China's brand. The latest example of this global shopping spree is a $13 billion cash offer by the China-based Anba Insurance Group-led consortium for the U.S.-based Starwood Hotels and Resorts Worldwide. It's seen as a game-changer that could potentially block a sale to U.S. hotel giant Marriott International this Thursday. There's also the $1.1 million cash deal by AMC Entertainment Holdings for Carmike Cinemas earlier this month that led the Chinese-owned company to become the largest movie theater operator in the U.S. China's participation in the Korean M&A market last year also increased 128 percent from a year earlier to a record $1.9 million in transaction volume, mainly targeting companies in the insurance and entertainment sectors. Kim Jiang, Arirang News. A Japanese politician has said he's very sorry to all victims of Japan's wartime sex slavery. Now, according to a report by Japan's Kyoto News, Itsunori Onodera, a member of Japan's Diet and former defense minister, delivered his personal apology during a keynote speech at a U.S.-Japan alliance conference in Los Angeles Monday. The six-term lawmaker said, based on a very personal point of view, Japan's sex slavery before and during World War II is something that's unacceptable regardless of whether it was forced or not. The Korean government has a new emblem to represent itself. It's part of a government efforts to create a unified emblem of one symbol for all government ministries. Now, the new design is based on the uh, taeguk, a symbol that's front and center on the Korean flag. Our Park ji shows us the new dynamic open-ended taeguk mark. This is the new official emblem of the Korean government. Using white, blue and red as the main colors, the Taeguk design takes center stage. Below it are the words for Republic of Korea. The Taeguk, which is also on the national flag, is an ancient symbol that dates back some 1400 years in Korea and has long represented the spirit of the Korean people. The swirling red and blue semicircles represent the hope for harmony of yin and yang. It projects a more dynamic image compared to previous government emblems. Culture Minister Kim Jong-duk said the new logo will not only save taxpayers money, but also help the government better communicate with the public. Previously, each ministry and agency had their own logo that often changed when there were cabinet reshuffles. It made it difficult for the public to remember and recognize logos. A survey last year showed that 54 percent of people could not identify any of the 22 emblems used by government ministries. To counter the problem, a team of experts carried out polls and research for a year, eventually leading to the creation of this new logo that will give the government a unified identity. It will be applied to all ministries starting in May. Park ji Arirang News. Well, the weather is warm and toasty here in Korea. In fact, today definitely felt like we're fully in the spring season. Now, that also means we'll start to see those spring flowers come to full bloom all across the country. It's, it's a splendid sight, really. But as our Kwon Jang reports, we may even get to see those trees turn bright pink, yellow, all colors floral, sooner than previous years. Spring is almost here. As the cold starts to lose its bite, people are venturing outside to enjoy the warmer weather. And although the trees still look bare, they are starting to show signs of life. Here at Yoido Park in Seoul, the cherry blossoms are not quite ready to come out just yet. But in the next few weeks, they'll be in full bloom and showering this area with petals. 
the fragrant flowers are expected to start appearing in the south of the country towards the end of the month, and the trend will work its way up to Seoul by the second week of April. Before then, other flowers marking the start of spring will also be popping up around the country. There are reports that the yellow Forsythia flowers are already visible in Korea's southernmost island of Jeju, and the azaleas should also start appearing a few days later. This year's flowers are coming a few days earlier than usual, but because of global warming, that's becoming a far more regular occurrence. Because the temperature is rising every year, it's causing blooming season to arrive earlier. Compared to the 1980s, it's coming about five to seven days sooner now. That means events around the country celebrating the season sometimes have difficulty adjusting. The Jeju Cherry Blossom Festival is scheduled to start on April 1st, but it's now likely to miss the height of the cherry blossom season, forecast to come four days earlier. Meanwhile, many other flower festivals are starting this week, with the Mewa Festival in Kwanyang on Friday and the Kure Sansuyu Festival on Saturday. And in Seoul, the Yeido Spring Flower Festival is set to begin on April 4th. It's one of the biggest events at this time of year, and visitor numbers are expected to be in the millions. Kwon Zhang Wu, Arirang News. Myanmar's parliament has elected the country's first civilian president since the military junta took power in 1962. Now, Tin Che, a close advisor and loyal friend to Nobel laureate Aung San Suu Kyi, was nominated by the National League for Democracy Party last week and voted into the presidency by parliament today. Suu Kyi, barred from the presidency under an army-drafted constitution, has made clear that Tin Che will act as her proxy. Yun Shin reports. Myanmar embarks on a new democratic era as Tin Cha from the National League for Democracy claimed victory on Tuesday, earning 360 parliament votes out of 652, ending the 40-year-old military government. Tin Cha is known to be one of Aung San Suu Kyi's closest confidants. Suu Kyi, widely known as Myanmar's lady, has been the global symbol of democracy, fighting against the military junta for decades. Since November, the NLD party, led by Suu Kyi, has claimed the majority of seats in Congress. Despite strong support from the people of Myanmar, the current constitution set by the military party specifically targeting Suu Kyi prevents her from becoming Madame President. Enter Tin Cha, Suu Kyi recommended her former driver and secretary as the party's presidential candidate. Although Suu Kyi cannot become the president, Tin Zhe is a close aide and we can trust him. That's why I'm satisfied about this. But there are some concerns from the international community that Suu Kyi may end up having too much influence over Tin Cha. Even Suu Kyi said she would rule above the president. Without a doubt, the constitution is far from being democratic. But this is the first time a democratic government is introduced. I'm concerned that Suu Kyi is trying to cheat the system, which will set an unhealthy precedent for the future. As of now, the nation is celebrating the official end to the military government. The president-elect will take office on April 1st. Ian Shin, Arirang News. Meanwhile, over in the U.S., voters are just waking up on the biggest day of voting since Super Tuesday. Bruce Harrison is live in the studio with me. Now, Bruce, uh, what's at stake um, in what many call this a mini Super Tuesday? Well, Kun Young, depending on the outcome of voting today, the nomination process for the Republican Party could become very complicated. Now, let's focus on one Republican frontrunner, Donald Trump's, one of his rivals, rather, that's Ohio Governor John Kasich. Support among, Repo among Republicans seeking to back an establishment candidate appears to have shifted from junior Florida Senator Marco Rubio to the Ohio Governor. Governor. On Monday, he took a dig at Trump during a rally. And I'm not excusing these protests. There's something people are protesting. But I will not take the low road to the highest office in the land in order to get there. I can promise you that. I will not do it. If Kasich wins in his home state of Ohio, he could gain the support he needs to win more states and block Trump from winning enough delegates to be the outright nominee. On the Democratic side, Vermont Senator Bernie Sanders and former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton are polling closely in several key states. 
Russian President Vladimir Putin says the main part of the Russian military will begin to withdraw from Syria. In the surprise announcement, Putin told his diplomats to boost efforts for peace as U.N. brokered talks resumed on ending Sy Syria's civil war. Syria said President Bashar al-Assad agreed on the reduction of Russian forces in a telephone call with Putin and denied any rift between the two countries. The president of the United Nations Security Council expressed support for Putin's decision. When we see forces withdrawing, it means war is being taken a different step. So that's good. He said the withdrawal announcement is a result of U.S.-Russian cooperation. Now, Bruce, uh, has Russians uh, laid out any timeline for this withdrawal? Well, we've seen some footage from the Russian Defense Ministry of fighter jets taking off from some, from some bases in Syria, so it's underway, apparently. Uh, but we don't really know yet um, how many exactly forces Putin plans to pull out. Right. It was a rather surprising move, uh, and we'll have to wait and see how that unfolds there. All right, Bruce, thank you so much for today. My pleasure. Well, time now to get a check on the weather conditions and that with our Yi Hun at the Weather Center. Now, Ji Hun, so our Kwon Jang Ho reported to us that spring flowers are set to bloom across the nation sooner than previous years. So while it may be a welcome sign for many of us, there are those out there who are dreading this change. That's right, Kwon Young. Spring is a beautiful season, but it's also the time of year when seasonal allergies kick up as budding trees and blooming flowers can cause sniffling and sneezing. Right. A friend of mine um, has those allergies, and I've heard that eating uh, spring fruits like strawberries and green vegetables uh, like uh, water celery can help those allergy sufferers. Definitely. That's a good tip. And also wearing a mask is a good way to filter out all the dust flooring around. And if you're in any of these brown-colored regions, you need to have a mask handy tomorrow. The ultra-fine dust levels are forecast to be high during the day. But despite moderate cloud coverage, we had a beautiful spring day here in the capital. Now tomorrow should be sunnier and slightly milder but lower single digits to start Wednesday morning as the daily low here is hot and Daejeon will start out at 2 degrees Celsius for for Daegu. And as for the daily highs, Seoul will top out at 13 while Daegu and Busan will top out at 18 and 16. Now readings will remain above norms for the time being with rain in the forecast at the end of the week. Now that's Korea for you and here's the international weather for views around the world. Well, tomorrow is supposed to have a big temperature gap uh, between the day's highs and lows, as our EGN says. So uh, be sure to pick up a cardigan before you leave out the door tomorrow. And that is our broadcast on this Tuesday night. I'm Moon Gan Young. Thank you, as always, for watching. And we hope to see you right back here, same time tomorrow on News Center.